Memphis. She was the only person that ever left the Dale. Memphis. The only place in the world we were given the chance to imagine. As far back as I can remember, much of it buried away in the hazy corners of my mind. In the months before we were taught to read, before we were allowed televisions, the days before the outside world existed to us, Memphis told us of Memphis. She said that she watched the lightning as she flew through the clouds. She could reach out and nearly touch the stars. As her ability to fly dawned on us as children, a world was born. A world outside of the farms and the schoolyards and the dinner tables and gardens and living room floors. A whole world. Most were not entirely comfortable in her presence, but there was something so undoubtedly attractive about her. She was there for all of us, yet forever inaccessible. We lived within her sphere, and yet most never penetrated her hiddenness. To imagine was to somehow participate in her mystery, but it was also to understand that you could never really know her. Her gravitational pull was down to enthusiasm. She so showed no interest in us as people, but only in her ability to share with us. She ran away many times, sometimes for days on end, and would always come back to share her stories. Her parents took no notice. Their neglect easily misunderstood as respect for her sense of discovery. What further developed my infatuation were our similarities in looks. For, from a distance, both the boys in the schoolyard and our mothers would often get us confused. I was never the centre of attention, unless I was mistaken to be her. Yet I often found myself the centre of her attention, and that was more than enough. Memphis would not rise to people's uncompromising adoration. She would brush it off, ignore it. Memphis gave herself to books and learning, reading under the covers to hide her literature and scientific intake, secret from her parents. She told me she never felt as good as when she was sleeping, a torchlight creating universes in the back of her eyelids. Her father was a bull of a man. Even now, to think of him, resurface as a burning sensation in the pit of my stomach. Coming home from, from a particularly extended exploration of the local landscape, Memphis noticed a faint glimmer of orange in her garden. Upon arriving at her home, she discovered her parents stood watching the swing set that had once inspired the dream of flight, engulfed in flame. She used to get the wrong bus to discover new ways of trekking home. Memphis did it with a boy when she was young. He was two or three years above us. She told us all what happened, how he leaned up against her, how he held her and squeezed her and pushed himself in and out of her and panted and sweated. She never became subject to the same upheavals as us. Her dramas were of a different order, internal, Without doubt they were more brutal, but without the abrupt punctuation forming the sentences and paragraphs that was spelling out our lives. She called me about a week before she learnt to fly, and told me of a dream that she'd had recently. In the dream she went into a charity shop with her mother and father. She was looking through the books. After a moment she realised that she had read every single one of them in chronological order. The books were a map of her childhood, of Memphis. She was remembering all of those different things that had happened to her when she was reading the books. She traced along the shelf, her teenage years, more and more books to fill her hunger for knowledge and dampen the inherent distance she felt towards her peers. Then she got to the book that she was currently reading. She took it from the shelf. The final chapter was blank. She noticed something in the corner of her eye, next to her, was herself, offering a cup of tea. Her clothes were soaked, clinging onto a swollen skin, her eyes bloodshot, her elbows bloodied and torn into shreds of dark gore. She realised that she wasn't in the room anymore, her parents were gone, and then she woke up. Whatever she became since I last saw her, 
I can't shake the feeling that she was already an echo of that person when she came back from Memphis. She was formed very quickly. She was visible, in focus, far before we became people of shape. I do not think I would be wrong in saying that I have kept the aura of those days inside me, and to that extent I can still feel how we all felt back then. In her last letter to me during my time at university, she told me that she had bought enough books to last her a lifetime. I guess she wasn't joking.